Three Destructions and Three Destroyers in Capitalism by Eric Schechter Capitalism is causing war, poverty, and ecocide, which are about to kill us all. That's not just random chance. These destructions are built into the very foundations of capitalism, so they can't be reformed away or healed like some superficial corruption. The problem is not limited to corrupt capitalism, crony capitalism, corporate capitalism, or any other kind of capitalism with an adjective. It's in every kind of capitalism. It's in just plain old capitalism. But really, I'm using the word capitalism as an approximation. It's not quite right. War, poverty, and some mild forms of ecocide are all about 10,000 years old much older than capitalism. We need a better explanation of the root problem. Some people get away from the system analysis. They just blame our problems on bad rulers. And that explanation fits, with only a little stretching. The wars are all based on lies. The poverty is due to bad distribution. And our rulers are doing too little about ecocide. But that explanation really just relocates the question, what causes bad rulers? If we simply jail the bad rulers without changing our culture, it will quickly generate a new batch of bad rulers. We need to change something in our culture, but what? I would start by pointing to what happens when some people have a lot of power over other people. Power corrupts, as we can see in schoolyard bullying, domestic violence, police brutality, prison torture, and war atrocities. That's all might makes right, which seems to me a good definition of fascism. We need to restructure our society so that power is not concentrated in a few people. Power is concentrated mainly through the institutions of hierarchy and property. We need to replace those with horizontalism and sharing, respectively. Hierarchy and property aren't really very different. Each can be used to buy the other. But it's hard for most people to see anything wrong with them, because those institutions have been the foundations of human society for 10,000 years. Revolution or Extinction Due to feedback loops, Global warming is speeding up exponentially. That means it starts off small and slow, easy to overlook or deny. But the bigger it gets, the faster it grows. After a while, it's enormous and growing explosively. Even the death of most of humanity won't halt those feedback loops. The temperature will continue rising and will snuff out the last of us. We might still be able to avert this apocalypse if we make drastic changes to our way of life. But we'd better be quick about that. Crop failures have already begun. Things keep turning out worse than the IPCC's predictions. So when they recently said we must turn things around by 2030, I figured 2025. And we can't turn things around overnight, so we'd better get started now. To halt global warming, we'll need deep changes in our way of life, both individually and through our governments. But our rulers are doing far too little too late. They can't be persuaded to change their ways. Their policies are dictated by our economic system, as I'll explain. And they rig the elections and the news media to retain their grip on power. So we have to overthrow them. Call it revolution but perhaps awakening is a better word. The main thing holding us back is widespread belief in the lies of the corporate government and the corporate press. We must spread awareness and understanding throughout the 99%, then overthrowing the 1% will be easy. But we have little time left for this revolution, and we haven't time to do it twice, so we'd better not omit anything. To change our culture, we must understand it better. I'm going to discuss some important intermediate phenomena, 
which are caused by capitalism, property, hierarchy, and which cause war, poverty, ecocide. These intermediate phenomena are externalities, inequality, and separateness. I'm calling these destroyers for lack of a better word. I'll explain how they are inherent in the system and can't be reformed away. To stop them, we'll have to overthrow the system and replace it with something entirely different. Externalities Any trade is negotiated between buyer and seller, but the trade may affect other parties who were not consulted, such as employees, the community, the ecosystem. The side effects are outside the concerns of the negotiators, so they're called externalities, or externalized costs. Generally, they're unplanned, unmeasured, and destructive. In particular, carbon pollution in the atmosphere is the main cause of global warming. This is happening because the basic principle of capitalism is every man for himself, get all you can, and to hell with the commons. Thus, the commons, including the ecosystem, is being destroyed. The commons is the shared area, like Sherwood Forest and the Tales of Robin Hood. When humans first appeared on this planet 200,000 years ago, there were no owners, and all of nature was shared area. Though land has been resold many times, every parcel of land originated in a theft from the commons. That observation is close to what Proudhon meant by property is theft. A living whale has no market value, but the parts of a recently killed whale are worth a great deal of money. That's typical. All the world is being privatized, monetized, and chopped up into little bits under capitalism. The ecosystem can't survive this abuse. It's being killed but it was never seen as a living thing. Under capitalism, nature is viewed as raw materials, which are priced at their extraction cost, not their replacement cost. The often praised efficiency of the market is a lie. The market's calculations can only consider measured costs. They omit externalities. Thus, overall, the market is terribly inefficient. It may even result in our extinction. Inequality. Economic inequality in our society has become enormous. A few people are super rich and getting richer, and everyone else is getting poorer. That's not happening by accident. It's built into our economic system. I'll explain that increasing inequality is the inevitable result of not sharing. That fact doesn't seem to be widely understood. The following explanation of mine is a slight variant of Piketty's 2013 analysis. If we don't share, we trade for labor, money, food, shelter, interest on loans, everything. In and of itself, voluntary trade appears harmless, perhaps even beneficial. But trade is more profitable to the trader who was already in the stronger bargaining position so it makes him stronger still. Thus, trade increases inequality. And think of deception and coercion merely as additional bargaining tools. The strong use their advantage to increase their advantage. Another example of might makes right. So we might even say property is fascism. How does inequality affect government? Well, wealth is power and influence. Thus we arrive at plutocracy, which means rule by a small wealthy class. We can't end that by electing better plutocrats. It will only end when we no longer have a small wealthy class. That requires sharing, as I explained a few moments ago. Our democracy is a sham that helps our rulers hold on to power. Exit polls show that the elections are rigged. The corporate news media keep us misinformed about the issues. Statistics show that the rich get the public policies they want and the rest of us don't. 
The USA has been a plutocracy thinly disguised as a democracy ever since its founding in land theft, genocide, and slavery. In fact, all the world has been ruled by the rich for 10,000 years, ever since the invention of property and hierarchy. But for 200,000 years before that, we lived and shared as equals. And genetically, that's still who we are. So plutocracy is only our culture, not our nature. The plutocrats are destroying the ecosystem, but it's not a conscious, intentional plan. Indeed, if the plutocrats were a unified hierarchy, like the fabled Illuminati, they would say to one another, Come, let us save the ecosystem, on which even we are dependent. But the plutocrats are doing almost nothing about the climate problem. Evidently, they're not unified. In fact, they're all competing against each other. Each individual plutocrat is concerned only with his own short-term profits, which keep him in power. He says to himself, I'll let someone else worry about the ecosystem. And that's not surprising. After all, even if the reformists were right, and selfishness somehow could be made sustainable, why would anyone bother? Corporations are compelled by competition and by their legal charters, to maximize immediate profits by any means available, disregarding or even concealing whatever long-term harm may result. The biggest corporations, particularly those that sell fossil fuels, are dependent on the status quo and want no alterations in it. So they use their influence to block any legislation for change. The only way to really end corruption is to end its incentive, the pursuit of private advantage. We must create a society in which the only way to get ahead is by bringing everyone ahead. To do that, we must overthrow the whole economic and political system. That will take all of us. And how does inequality affect the relation between the individual worker and his or her boss? Well, even relative poverty means that someone else controls your life. Our workplaces are dictatorships. That's why we hate Mondays. People at the top have creative jobs with flexible hours. People at the bottom have meaningless drudgery in unpleasant and often unsafe conditions, designed solely to make the people at the top richer. The market makes us all commodities to be exploited or discarded. Capitalists don't want poverty to end, because it keeps wages low. You can't ask your boss for a raise, because he'll reply that there's a long line of unemployed or low-paid people who would love to replace you. That situation is aggravated further by automation. Machines are taking more and more of our jobs. That would mean more vacation for all of us if we were all sharing the benefits of automation. But we're not. A few people own the robots, and they get rich. The rest of us get layoffs. We compete ever more desperately for the few jobs that remain, enabling the bosses to lower the salaries of those jobs. Separateness. Property separates us. That's built into the so-called American dream. You keep your stuff in your house. I keep my stuff in my house. I don't need to care about you, and in fact, I can't afford to care about you. Competition kills empathy, but we have a culture of competition at work and at play. Your loss is not my loss and might even be my gain. Anything constructive that we do competitively could be done better cooperatively, but that option isn't offered to us. Under these circumstances, it's easy for me to believe that your problems are your own fault, and my own problems are your fault, too. Believing that is easier for me than facing up to the fact that my own downfall may be next, the system is unjust, and I don't know how to fix it. These circumstances give rise to racism, sexism, xenophobia, and other kinds of bigotry. These circumstances give rise to greed, lies, authoritarianism, imperialism, austerity, and other cruelties. 
These circumstances give rise to random shootings in churches, schools, theaters, etc. As technology advances, more powerful weapons become available to all of us. Soon, suicidal madmen will be able to 3D print guns in their basements. Gun registration laws can't protect us. We'll only be safe in a culture of caring and sharing that leaves no one behind, so that no one wants to hurt us. Of course, it's not enough to preach love and kind intentions. We must actually change our institutions and our way of life to reflect our caring. Then artificial scarcity will disappear, and we'll find that we have plenty enough to go around. Then we'll be paid not according to how much we produce or how much we control, but how much we need. It's ironic that if you ask people, most of them will say, Sure, I'd like to be part of a caring, sharing world, but most people will never go along with that. You and I just need to get most people talking with each other. Join the conversation. A transcript for this video and links to related materials can be found at leftymathprof.org.